Thank you. Um, uh, even for somebody who works in advertising, to hear what I'm about to talk to you about described as a keynote constitutes a bit of an overclaim. I, uh, I emailed Steffi last week to say I'm really thrilled that I am actually going to be able to get to, uh, to Munich for DLD Women. I've been uh, several times over the years and uh, I absolutely love it. I said I'm, I'm definitely going to be able to be there, really looking forward to seeing you. And she emailed back within about four minutes and said, fantastic, pick a topic and talk for ten minutes. <coughs> and I always do what well, Steffi talks to me, she tells me to do. I, uh, I was trying to figure out why it is that I like DLD as much as I do. And uh, uh, it's partly because I get to reacquaint myself with old, old friends, people I've met here, or people I've met elsewhere but somehow only ever see here. Uh, partly because I make new friends whenever I'm here. Partly because I get some... Uh, always some useful advice, something I can take away with me and do. Um, and so there's always a hang. I get all four of those things uh, from DLB. Uh, so I thought I'd try and do something, I'd try and give you something useful. Um, a couple of Septembers ago, I uh, spent four magical days at the Villa San Michel just outside Florence uh, doing a cookery course. Um, and every morning at about 10 o'clock, eight of us would go into the kitchen and the wonderful chef there would very gently guide us through the preparation of what was then going to be our lunch. And I've, I've got two very important tips for you that I learned. Um, the first is when you've been cutting garlic and you want to get the garlic off your fingers, just, just run cold water over your fingers. That's all you have to do. Don't, don't rub, don't wash, because if you rub and wash, you, you actually rub the garlic into your skin. It sounds really counterintuitive, but all you have to do is turn on the cold tap and, and dangle your hand in front. That's tip number one. Tip number two is, uh, in order to make the most magnificent tiramisu, uh, Substitute half of the whipped cream uh, with, a, with a meringue mix, beaten egg whites and sugar, and you use that instead of the whipped cream for half of the whipped cream meat. And it just makes it much lighter and fluffier and sweeter, a much better tiramisu. So those are two very useful things that you can take away with you. In the afternoons, after uh, I'd done my cooking course, uh, I learned a lot more. And I had a wonderful guide called Helena who taught me everything I now know and I knew nothing at the time about Michelangelo. Uh, what a remarkable, remarkable man he was. And I hadn't realized um, until she explained it to me um, that up until, right up until the very end of Michelangelo's life, all art was commercial. Uh, we hadn't yet got to the point where uh, somebody could uh, cut a sheep in half, stick it in a, in a tank and, and cover it in formaldehyde and say it's brilliant, it's art love, and, and Charles Sarchi would make a market for it. That hadn't happened. Nobody was allowed to just say, I've got this amazing idea, I'm going to make it, and somebody may buy it. Everything was commercial. Everything was commissioned. Every piece of art was commissioned. And you had your clients, and some of them were very big, and in the case of Michelangelo, the Medici family were his, by far his largest client. They totally owned him. Um, and one day, he uh, was given this brief. Do me a David. Now, I'm in the advertising business. Do me a da David had been done. David had been done tens of thousands of times. Uh, before the Medici gave Michelangelo this brief. And if you're a, a free spirit and an artist like Michelangelo, uh, potentially that's, it's just not a good moment when you're asked to do me a day, to do me something that, that thousands of people have already done. Um, and yet, he produced this. Single most important, in my view, single most important piece of sculpture ever produced. To the same brief 
that had been given to thousands, thousands of artists. He created something completely different, completely new. He uh, stuck to the brief that broke all the rules. Up until this point, uh, David's had always been represented as a teenage boy, uh, usually uh, dressed in a chimney, almost always after he'd slain Goliath, usually with the, the head of the giant at his feet. And so all of the paintings of David looked like all of the sculptures of David had that in it. Michelangelo had a completely fresh perspective on the same grief. He said to himself, what if, what if, Michael, uh, what if David, instead of being a symbol of, of vulnerability, was, was a symbol of strength? What if he was really strong? And instead of being a teenage boy, he was a fully grown man. And what if instead of wearing a tunic, he was naked, exposed, feeling exposed, uh, feeling both powerful and anxious? Uh, and what if it was before he'd, he'd killed the giant, before he killed Goliath? So you have this amazing perspective of David looking up, not at you, but looking up, and his face as this uh, simul it's simultaneously anxious and full of confidence. A completely different perspective, a completely different insight into David, into the same guy. Second thing he did uh, was he took a big piece of marble that another sculptor had projected, uh, what those of us in the media business call remnant inventory. Uh, so, a, a large chunk of marble nobody else wanted. Uh, and because it, it had a vein in it, and because of that, he was able to create uh, his David more than twice the size, more than twice life size. And up until that point, all sculptors of, of uh, men, and they were mostly men, uh, were always life size. But he created this thing which was more than twice life size. And, and for those of you who haven't seen it, that in and of itself is a remarkable um, shift. When you stand and stare at it, it takes your breath away. Uh, he crafted it, he crafted it like no piece of work had ever been crafted before. It took him three years, three years to make his day. So, I look at this and I thought, you know, the greatest innovations, the greatest creativity comes not from thinking about something new to do. Uh, it comes from really thinking very creatively and working very hard on a new way of doing something old. An existing, established behavior that you can find a much better way of doing it. I, uh, there, was a, there was a piece in the New Yorker a little, a little bit after Steve Jobs' death, um, which was challenging the notion that Steve Jobs was a great inventor. A lot of people that talked about Steve Jobs being like Edison, a great inventor. Um, and Malcolm Gladwell, who wrote the piece, said he wasn't a great inventor, he was a great perfecter. He, was a, he took things that already existed and made them perfect. He didn't invent the MP4 player, but he perfected it as an iPad. He didn't invent the mobile phone, but he perfected it as, his iPad, as, the, as the iPhone. And I think that uh, at, at, at an event like this, you know, where we're all talking about the possibilities of the digital world and technology in the future, it's all very it's, it's easy to get sucked up into believing that we should be looking for brand new things to do. And my lesson uh, from my three days in Florence is that it's probably more of a challenge but ultimately much more rewarding and you'll leave much more of a legacy by finding a much, much better way of doing something that is already being done. Like substituting half of the whipped cream in a tiramisu with a meringue. Thank you very much.